you very much, Sarah. Uh, first important question, you can see the slides, hopefully. We, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, we can see you, yes. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, okay. So, so should, can I start or should I wait for the minute? No, no, it is a... Uh, okay. <laughs> you, can, you can begin now if you want, if you wish. Yeah. So, I mean, of course, uh, thank you very much, Jan, and also the, uh, the organizers for this invitation. It's always very nice to be at CUP now virtually, but I, I hope at least uh, this way some more people can participate. Um, and the talk I would like to give today is about a topic which I think is quite in the spirit of CUP because um, it is about this type of research which tries to make sense of, uh, of the deeper links, the mathematical links between approaches to manipulation of graph-like structures in computer science, mathematical physics, and mathematics. So, I mean, uh, of course, every of these disciplines has many, many uh, examples of situations where it is meaningful to, to look at these type of manipulations. Um, for example, the very simplest such is drawn here at the bottom. It's just when you, when you manipulate um, for example, in physics, indistinguishable particles, this would be a model of chemistry, for example. Um, then, of course, in social network science, maybe you, you, you look at processes which can be formalized as, you know, manipulating locally a network graph, like, for example, the rewiring and edge check here. But then there are also many, many more um, sort of Baroque examples. I mean, trees, for example, can be seen as a type of graph which has additional structure, like particular incidences, for example. And my personal motivation is really from organic chemistry and from biochemistry, where you encounter these beautiful types of theories, uh, where, for example, you formalize proteins and other molecules through these type of arriving steps. And uh, sort of my main motivation for this work is that um, I'm originally a, a mathematical physicist, um, but I'm now working in computer science, and I discovered that, that there's relatively little cross path between these three disciplines that would allow you, for example, to take a continuous time Markov chain theory and directly apply it to one of those uh, organic chemistry simulation techniques in biochemistry, say, for example. And of course, one of the main motivations is to ask, so in these type of very complex systems, um, where can you attack with combinatorics? So what, what are the combinatorial structures, of course, beyond the data type of these uh, graphical structures, um, that one could use uh, to, to analyze the systems. And I, I'm, I'm just putting this here because, um, at least for bio and organic chemistry, it is really the case that, I mean, sometimes you have abstractions which are made because you can then at least as a toy model talk about these systems. But at least in the case of uh, bio and organic chemistry, these are really the state of the art techniques to simulate these systems. So. Um, and Kappa is a framework where you have these sort of so-called side graphs as a special type of graph, you know, uh, every vertex has some sites at which you can link to other vertices. And in organochemistry, it's even more fantastic. It's really that the molecules you draw by hand also for chemical reactions are a data type that you can then formulate transformations on. And so these are the two main frameworks. So if you, I mean, uh, I will say a little bit about this later on, and it so happens that there's really a very formal semantics for these type of theories. And that is good because it, that is really, I mean, it's very mathematical formulation. So that's a, a plus. What's the what's problem is that if you then look really at a realistic scale example, and here's a little piece of the human metabolic network, in this, in this huge graph, every um, part of this network is I mean, an enormous complexity and you have a very many different types of molecules that participate in these reactions. And, and here's only drawn like the macromolecules or the larger molecules. And then you have enormously many reactions. And, and so the real question is all of these transitions, these manipulations are fired at random. So, so what is it really you can say about these systems? And especially if you, if you look at biology, which is still a very fast evolving field, of course. Um, I mean, it is nice that you have this interesting data type, which is quite good also at, you know, encapsulating new knowledge you have about just individual transitions. But you can see immediately, uh, since every of these uh, green blobs, these agents, has typically on the order of seven to 10 sites, this is an extremely highly combinatorial data structure. And then if you start manipulating, it is very unclear of what you can actually extract as information. So main problem is to understand the function of such systems, because nature has given them 
this is the abstraction that is very accurate. So what can you say about the function of these systems? And so, um, so, so to, to just motivate how one could approach this, I'm going to take an example of a transformation system, which is of course much simpler than these biochemical reactions, but it's complicated enough to explain uh, the main sort of route of attack for these systems. So here's a system where you have an input state, which is just some graph. Now performing a transformation. So the language for these transformations always looks similar. You have um, little pieces of evolution, if you will. Each of those is asking for some input drawn at the bottom in this little cartoon, and some, then it produces some output. And uh, the output here is, uh, so the input is here, some two vertices. The dashed lines indicate that they are kept throughout the transformation, so identically kept. And then you link them up with, with an edge. That's, that's this local manipulation. And the second part of, the, of this framework, of the semantics, is that you, to apply such a rule, you have to exhibit a match. And a match is nothing but an embedding of this input motive into the graph. You see immediately that, I mean, here I've drawn a very, very small graph. Uh, and I mean, this rule is sufficiently simple. But already here, you have quite a high number of possible matches. So part of, of this sort of encoding is that it's usually quite simple to write the rules, but I mean, there's usually quite many ways of applying these rules. But anyway, so, so then here, uh, applying the rule amounts to locally then you know, running this transformation, which here amounts to inserting this edge in these two vertices. So let's do a few more of those steps. So another of such, exactly the same rule applied at a different place. Um, now, of course, I mean, I'm, I'm only showing some very simple rules. You could also have one which unlinks, for example, like this one. And let's take another one to link and another one to link. OK, so now I have given you a, sh a small sequence of the transformation uh, system. And very nicely, um, not only for this particular case, but I mean, for an enormous variety of possible things of graph-like structures and their manipulations, they are all covered by a mathematical theory called categorical rewriting. And nicely enough, it is very close to implementation sources. I mean, this is something you can you can put very directly into algorithms. So it's sort of the source code for these sort of uh, manipulations. But sort of the typical problem is now, I mean, going into this picture of what happens in biochemistry and how could you understand it. So imagine you were given this type of transformation. You had a little vocabulary, say just the linking of edges and the unlinking. But now you were asking, so of all of these possibilities, what is the likelihood of if you fire these, say, at random with same probability for sake of argument, uh, of seeing a triangle appearing? Yes. So I mean, you're, you're trying to track uh, how many times you see a triangle that was really produced, I mean, newly produced or maybe deleted through this application of sequences. And so what classical writing theory doesn't have much of an answer to is how to approach this and utilizing this feature of writing. So what one can do, and this is now, I will motivate this more later on, but um, sort of the, the starting point of this combinatorial analysis I would like to propose has to do with, of course, you can track how actually these rules were applied. And, and here in this picture, you, you see that these are simply just, uh, the, I think, five steps, one after another drawn work vertically. And whenever you, uh, you attack with the second, third, fourth rule at uh, a position where you have previously already applied a rule, then this is marked with these uh, light blue lines. And the red lines mean if you touch something that is in your original graph, but not interacting. And so immediately it is obvious that there's some combinatorics in how you can sort of plug together these, uh, these transformations interacting with each other versus how, how they are acting on, on, on this graph state. So again, like if you, if you now look at um, this problem of finding triangles, you discover something very important, namely that um, sort of producing a triangle is an inherent feature of, uh, of this above sequence of rules. I mean, because they are plugged together in a way that they are guaranteed to produce a triangle. There might be other ones that, that accidentally are produced by just simply linking up a V-shape, say, with one edge. But that is definitely already one guarantee you can give. This sequence will produce a triangle. And the other point of interest is, um, so these two parts of the transformation sequence highlighted in orange, um, of course, they are happening. This is one possibility to apply. But the two actually do not contribute anything to the production of the triangle. 
in fact, uh, they, they, they only sort of, they produce an edge and, and delete it later on. So that, that actually doesn't contribute anything to this count. So what one needs is some sort of mechanism, how one can analyze this combinatorially. Um, and, uh, and the way to do it is to first put to as first class citizens, so to speak, these interactions of rules. So in some shape um, to produce these type of diagrams uh, with a recursive or other uh, generative mechanism and to reason about their combinatorics. And, and, and these objects is, are what I call tracelets. Um, okay. So the plan of the talk is that um, I would like to start from some, something which I think is quite close to interest of many people in the audience, which is um, certain type of Hopf algebras, uh, which have been introduced by Gerard Duchamp, Carol Penson and, and others, uh, which give exactly sort of the blueprint of this type of combinatorial construction. And then pretty much the second part of the talk is um, giving you a little background on categorical writing theory, just, just enough to demonstrate how, 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 this, uh, how this works. Um, and then um, to show you how you get to tracelets and in particular some notion of algebras that replaces these diagram of algebras in the general case. Okay, so the, for, for me personally, I, um, I uh, started working on this about five years ago and I was studying this paper by uh, Gerard Duchamp, Carol Penson and uh, their collaborators from 2011. Um, which was uh, called combinatorial algebra of, uh, for second quantum, quantum theory. Okay, um, and, and and so from from this idea, I developed uh, my very first version of some notion of graphical algebras, uh, graph transformation algebras, together with Vasodanos and colleagues. Um, so so here really, if one so I'm, I'm I'm presenting to you sort of a slight reformulation of the results of Gerard and Carol. Um, in a language which then later directly generalizes to, to, to the case of rewriting, but it's, it's, it's completely equivalent. So the idea is if you, if you look at the manipulation of just graphs that have, do not have any vertices, then uh, one can imagine there's some very elementary things one can do. So, I mean, we, we are always only looking at isomorphism classes of graphs. So in this sense, you know, vertices are indistinguishable. Um, and then there are two transformations one can do elementary ones you can create, you can add some vertex or you can remove a vertex. Now, the starting point of getting to some notion of diagrams is that from these elementary building blocks, you can assemble larger diagrams and they will typically look as follows. So you have uh, some occurrences of these particular sort of little elements, so the creation and deletion. Uh, I should say that each diagram, you have vertices characterized as output and some as input. So in the pictures, because I mean, the creation only has one vertex in it, I, I draw these little dash lines to indicate whether it's an output or an input, yes. So they are read from bottom to top the diagrams. And then sort of the, the, the second information in the diagram is how some of these outputs some, some of these creations are then wired into inputs of some of the deletions. And so more mathematically speaking, I'm giving two sets, sets of input and output vertices um, and a relation between them, which should be one to one. Um, so that, and, and also I'm only considering again, a sort of essentially isomorphism classes of these type of diagrams. So more concretely, I'm, I'm looking at uh, equivalence classes under, you know, joint permutations of the vertex sets which preserves incident structure with this relation. Okay, so these are the diagrams. And now um, this beautiful idea from, from, from the aforementioned paper of Gerard and Carroll was that um, you can now enrich the mathematics by, uh, sorry, you can build a mathematics over these diagrams or the equivalence classes by constructing a vector space that, whose basis is indexed by these equivalence classes. So for each uh, diagram D, little d, you have a, a basis vector which I always write delta of D. And beautifully now, and this is of course, you will immediately see how this links to rewriting. Now one can construct on this vector space, a binary operation sort of called the diagrammatic composition. Um, and the idea is that if you, are, if you give two diagrams, you, uh, I mean, first the one, the one, and then the, the two, you can sum over all ways, you can consistently wire together these diagrams. Uh, meaning you, you have some, some um, like this drawing on the right here is for example, D1 and D2. Uh, this blue M12 are the two lines that link some inputs 
to some uh, some outputs to some inputs, and and then performing the composition amounts to forgetting that these were two diagrams wired together, sort of seeing the whole thing as one diagram, and of course taking a equivalence class, and so this gives a very nice composition operation, and the first important result is that this operation together, I mean, the, the vector space together with this binary operation gives an associative unital algebra um, called diagram algebra, um, whose unit element is the, the equivalence class of the empty diagram, or I mean, the basis vector associated to the empty diagram. So that, that for me was sort of the first, I mean, uh, the literature I knew was the first uh, description of such diagrammatic operation um, which you know reproduces some some combinatorics of these composition structures. Okay, and then sort of now looking more closely, we see that um, actually our our little catalog of elementary diagrams wasn't complete because uh, sort of one of the connected so so essentially elementary diagrams are the connected components of such larger diagrams, which are of course the creation and deletion of vertex diagram, but also the the the, the, the only other connected component you can get is creating a vertex and then deleting it again. So th these are the three elementary sort of, uh, sort of little mini diagrams. And if you simply introduce, so, so now we, we need a notation, which means sort of uh, pasting disjointly such, such elements, but I mean, up to isomorphism. So I mean, so, so happens to be the composition along trivial overlap in this definition. And it, of course, immediately by looking at these diagrams, how they are already drawn, you see that the equivalence class of any given diagram is given is completely characterized by the numbers of occurrences of these three elementary letters. Yes, so that's simply by the construction. And now that, of course, um, is already an interesting sign where one could get some combinatorics, and in particular, sort of the. Um, so when one looks very closely, one can define something called, uh, I mean, as usual, we now have a binary operation. So we can define uh, a bracket, a commutator. Um, I, I'm just using the ordinary comm commutator symbol for, of course, a commutator in, in this diagram algebra. Um, and so these three elements have the interesting property that um, if you take the Lie algebra formed by these three elements and the bracket, the, the only non-trivial commutation is of the, I mean, if you first create and then delete, uh, you have one more option, namely the E pattern than the other way around. So, I mean, that's the only commutation relation you have. So these three, um, the basis vectors of these three diagrams form the Heisenberg-Lie algebra. This is exactly the commutator structure of Heisenberg-Lie algebra. And now um, one can take um, sort of very nice results from the mathematical literature which is uh, poincare Birkhoff-Witt theorem. So if you form the universal enveloping algebra of the seismic Lie algebra, which is to say you, 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 you basically, uh, you, you can tensor uh, arbitrary basis vectors together of these, you know, chosen from these three types, modulo uh, a, a relation, which is created by uh, the ideal of, you know, exactly created by this commutation relation. Um, there is a very nice basis for this space, which is, I mean, giving some arbitrary order on the elements, but in particular, the one where you just sort first the string of all the V plus, uh, V dagger occurrences, and just all the Vs and then all the Es. Then you can write a basis for this universal enveloping algebra of the form shown here. This is a Poincare Birkhoff-Witt theorem. And now, um, so, so the interesting thing is, of course, uh, this is again, just characterized uh, by the triple of integers, the numbers of how many times each of the of these elementary basis vectors, of course. And so um, recalling that there was this notation of disjoint union of diagrams and that sort of the, the characterization of an equivalence class of a diagram is exactly by the numbers of connected components of each type. So it's motivated that you can actually find an isomorphism between elements of this diagram algebra and elements of this universal enveloping algebra, the heisenberg lie algebra. And uh, indeed, it's exactly just like for, for every disjoint union, you produce the ordered tensor product. And conversely, uh, going the other way around, you forget the, the order, essentially. But more than just sort of a coincidence, it, it turns out that um, this is actually also an isomorphism of algebras. So this exactly preserves the algebra, algebra product uh, uh, from D into, into U and the other way around. So that's, that's sort of the first nice observation. 
But of course, uh, since we have some people very uh, well vested in Hopf algebras here, um, it's of course well known that this Heisenberg Lie algebra, universal algebra, algebra is a Hopf algebra. So the question is, where do you get um, a co-product from? Because I mean, one could ask, is then also the diagram algebra a Hopf algebra? And indeed, uh, there's evidently this idea that you, you, you have some diagrammatic structure. It's already characterized through connected components. So if you really dissect a given diagram into connected components, now um, need some notation. So uh, effectively every element of, of, of the diagrams, of, of every possible diagram is just a disjoint union of uh, these connected diagrams. So in the notation, the only strange thing, but it's for convenience is that you say, uh, this joint union over empty set is uh, just the empty diagram. It's just to make this formula more consistent, uh, more notationally nice. And now the co-product is just the sum of all ways to partition parts of the diagram into the left tensor factor and parts of the diagram into the right tensor factor. Now, this, this definition gives you indeed uh, a, a co-product. And indeed, the isomorphism I showed before extends to Hopf algebra isomorphism. So you can indeed define a Hopf algebra structure on these diagrams. And I, I spare you, of course, all of these many axioms. But uh, and, and this was, uh, I think, one of the core results in the work of uh, Duchamp and Penson also. OK. And uh, I apologize if I found a typo this morning, so I had to write this by hand. But um, so so. If one now looks closely, I mean, so far we have just talked about high level properties of these diagrams, but one can simply just write down now the product of two elements in the diagram algebra. Again, they are characterized just by the numbers of occurrence of these elementary patterns. And the main point here is that there occurs a very interesting coefficient, which is the number of matchings of, um, so, so the first diagram has, uh, sorry, has uh, K1 outputs. So, Vertices created. The second one has L2 many uh, inputs, so vertices that will be deleted. And now the sum is over all ways of pairing those um, with forgetting the order of the pairing. So, and, and this is exactly the combinatorial coefficient, uh, the number of ways of doing this. But if you if you look now at the um, famous Heisenberg-Weil algebra, or more precisely, its representation, this number vector basis. So, I mean, of course, everyone knows this from, from quantum mechanics, for example. So there is an algebra defined over vector space indexed by just natural numbers, uh, which has two generators and their representations act as follows. So A dagger on the vector n gives you the vector n plus one, and A, the annihilator on vector n, gives you either the zero of the field if n was zero, or n times n minus one if not. Um, and indeed, the normal ordered elements in this algebra normal order means first all annihilators and all creators have precisely this above uh, number coefficient as in, in, in their algebra structure. And for, for Jean Penson, that was the motivation to, to, to study this diagram algebra because um, as you saw before, the coefficient is purely produced by combinatorics of matching uh, in these diagrams. And now one can immediately think about, so we will now simply um, I use different letters now. Uh, so before these were called V dagger and V for redis creation and deletion. I now use capital A dagger and A in the in the other algebra just to say these are, I mean, exactly the same diagrams, but seen in, in a different algebra. So for, for each, uh, there's a little dictionary where you say with uh, phi bar, you map, you forget of a diagram in this Hopf algebra structure, all the parts which are these create and then delete pieces. This way you get a diagram in, in, on, the, on the right hand side. And if you embed such a diagram in the larger algebra, you just uh, have a Hopf algebra diagram without any of these uh, create and then delete patterns. Um, and it turns out that this completes the picture very nicely because uh, now this gives you an algebra H, again defined over diagrams. Um, and it's exactly sort of a diagrammatic encoding of the Heisenberg-Weil algebra. So it's this algebra with the only commutator A with A dagger commuted gives the identity. And finally, sort of a little piece of the information is also that you, you have a representation, which is exactly just that, you know, to, to, to such a basis vector in H, you can assign an action on, on, on number vectors through representation. And so everything put together gives you a very nice picture of, uh, of the structure of, of Heisenberg-Weil algebra, 
mostly explained combinatorially. Yeah, and also even the representation. I mean, there's another way of seeing how the representation can even be be seen as a combinatorial action. And so, so in summary of this part, um, I found this back then extremely interesting because sort of all of the combinatorics of how these transformation steps interact is coded in these diagrams. And you then postpone to a later step through this representation row um, acting on states. And this is exactly the type of uh, deciphering that, that is needed to, to make progress in these transformation systems. Okay, and, and now I just wanted to, to show you one sort of, this is still a bit experimental, but I mean, sort of the, the, the key point about Heisenberg Bioalgebra is that you can formulate chemical reactions uh, in a language where you do not look at the internal structure of molecules. So you just count abstractly number of occurrences of different molecules. And so one can quickly write down um, a continuous time Markov chain for it. So, I mean, this is now in the sparkman fock basis where annihilation is d by dx, creation is multiplication with formal variable, and you are tracking the probability distribution over states with n particles coded as monomials xn. Anyway, so, and um, so, this is a birth death process. And if you, if you draw these pictures again, uh, the birth death process you know, chooses when to jump, when to perform transitions, either the creation or deletion. Um, and again, of course, we could imagine we now look at the picture in this, in this Hopf algebra. And there you would track uh, when a creation was followed immediately, or maybe at a later point, but, but connected um, with a deletion. So it's impossible to put a measure on any, any possible time point for this, but what you can do is you can put a box of time capital T and then just characterize the content of these transitions by exactly the classification into connected components. So creation, deletion events and uh, events where you create and then delete. And so there's a little trick. I mean, so far there is no Markov chain theory for the software algebras in that form to be developed. But uh, here, at least uh, when you when you create, you can simply mix as a different type of, of molecule. Um, and, then, and then when you delete, you can make a, sort of a little artifact, produce some third type of molecule. And this way, if you now track the numbers, one and you, know, you run all of this machinery, in the end, you can indeed get a nice expression, which tells you a little bit more about this dynamics, saying essentially, of course, you stabilize on a Poisson distribution ultimately, but you also see that in the time limit goes to infinity, you grow linearly with the number um, of these uh, create delete events. Yeah, so that's that's the dynamics of the system. And I mean, this is by no means a full theory yet. It's just like one very first motivation that presumably also in Markov chain theory one can extract some interesting information. Only that, of course, these key particles have very little structure. And so I return to the question: um, So how how could you now approach this for the much more complex situation? Where you're not describing just vertex graph, but you you're actually describing graph and hitting all of this combinatorial complexity. And so, just to recall, the idea is now pretty similar. So we will mostly focus on on first of all classifying combinatorially how to interact with rewriting steps, and sort of the ultimate goal would be to then understand if you want to count, for example, triangle patterns that are produced or created or deleted by such sequences, how can, you, how can you give a measure of likelihood on that? That's the ultimate goal. And again, we would like to um, somehow find a way, and this will be through commutators, of course, to, to sort of drop out some of the possible contributions, which, are, which do not actually influence the count. And the only sort of the, the real obstacle for this was that if you, I mean, this is a perfectly valid sequence of events, but at first sight, what, what complicates this is, so one could imagine these diagrams, the semantics will just be pairing of subgraph, you know, before we just paired uh, vertices to vertices uh, in these other diagrams, but here it turns out it's a little more intricate because actually here it seems you're pairing half edges. And, and that is sort of a, the real problem for, for this, um, I mean, how to come up with the con concrete generalization. And so um, after a lot of experiments, so I came up to formulate this in categorical writing theory. Um, and, and so, I mean, I mean, this is maybe a little bit of an exotic theory, but the nice thing about it is it's completely formal. And um, 
it can immediately be implemented in algorithms. So I, I'll tell you a little bit about this and then afterwards show you how, how you can produce these sort of the analog of these diagrams. Okay, so um, so the, the, the full generality of this theory is um, um, quite intricate because uh, in general, you not only look at graphical structures, but also some which are sort of constrained with additional structure constraints, for example, in trees. So, uh, and uh, I mean, so this is a paper which will um, jointly with Jean Krivin, which uh, should be published soon in, in the Applied Category Theory Journal Compositionality. Um, and so I just want to show you a little part of this theory enough to, to, to get the idea, hopefully. So before we had um, transformations were essentially specified as partial maps between inputs and outputs of vertices. This generalizes now in, in so we take a category typically, it, sh it should have some, some nice properties called adhesivity, um, but sort of the important thing to note is that any, so for example, graphs are such a category. Um, we can have undirected graphs, uh, multigraphs, and, and all sorts of variants of specifications. But uh, main point is uh, you, you take such a category and you can formulate partial maps and quotation marks as spans of monomorphism, so as spans of embeddings. And so in the most general framework, you on top can put some conditions which essentially constrict, uh, constrain how you can apply these rules. And uh, again, to, to, to make a meaningful theory, we, uh, I mean, this would in general be a, a class, even for graphs, even for good categories. So we typically also have to quotient by some notion of isomorphisms as we had to do in the diagram case. Um, okay. But this is sort of the analog of these little building blocks of the transitions that one can use. And sort of, unfortunately, then there's a little bit of, I mean, this is very general, it covers pretty much all of the known cases of such transformations, but for that, it's also a little bit technical. It is just to say sort of the analog of um, uh, finding an input pattern in a state X is now finding an embedding of I into X. And then how to, from that, you know, apply the rule, how to unroll this transformation depends on your semantics. And it's typically performed um, either in the double pushout semantics or in the Sesky pushout semantics. And the first one, um, is essentially trying to compute some notion of set complement to get this object uh, k-bar. And the second one is using some construction called final pullback complement. So, I mean, in, in these graphic, graphic theories, uh, push out is typically gluing together along common overlap. Pullback is finding intersection of two objects. Push out complement is roughly like the set complement. It's just that, for example, if you have a graph and you just try to delete a, a vertex, um, then it depends on whether this incident edges. So there's a, some, some difference, but other than that, it's, it's roughly the idea of applying these steps as in the graphical description. But um, so the key point is that there exists a notion uh, from the pure rewriting theory of how to compose two steps, how to, how to interact with two rules. And so this is very much like in the graphical language for these diagrams. You, you have two rules and you try to find an overlap of O1 of the output of the first rule with uh, the interface, the, the input I2 of the second. And so this is again coded as a partial overlap. And now you glue together along this partial overlap and then you just run the rules. That's essentially what this says. And of course there's some, some technical details for how to do this with conditions. Um, but I just wanted to show you um, I mean, I think intuitions are pretty good here also for the graph case. So I'm now drawing the diagrams from right to left instead of bottom to top to be more in parallel with this mathematical notation. So here I'm drawing a, a picture where I take two vertices. Um, I link them up with an edge and make an additional vertex and an edge. And then I use one of the vertices to link to it, um, to ask for it to an edge to be incident. And then, you know, delete that edge and make this new edge pattern. And so exactly how to interpret this diagram is to say, okay, so I'm, I'm encoding here a sequence of events where sort of the intermediate state is this shape where you glue together the patterns along the common overlap. And then you run essentially the, the, the one rule in the forward direction and the other in the backward direction. And now this is exactly the analog of these diagrams you saw before in this graphical case. So it's a sequence of events which was produced through interaction of these two rules. 
And sort of the, the overall input motive here on the very right top bottom is the necessary uh, pattern you need to find in any state to apply the sequence. So this is sort of the very first example of, of such diagrammatic calculus. So, um, so there is uh, one complication maybe uh, which prevented this from being useful from the start because just graphs are rarely very interesting. Uh, normally, in most of these applications, you want to have some more structured uh, 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 species. And for example, one very nice species, I think, which is also good communication grounds with the combinatorist, is, for example, planar rooted binary trees. And so if one wants to, you know, formalize this in this context of writing, the first step to note is that you can write, I mean, not only trees, but forest, of course, planar rooted binary forest. Um, you can see them as some type of graph, which are typed. So you can take the slice category over some, some type graph. So every edge is given one of three exclusive types, uh, either being left, right, or the bottom. And so that in itself is sort of a first step. But then, of course, you see it's not only a graph which is colored by these three types of edges, but also it has some a lot of structural properties. Um, and of these, I'm, I'm just listing some here. So for example, you never have uh, two leaves directly incident and, and you never have two, two of these root edges and so forth. So I mean, this is not very pretty. You, you, you can formalize this as conditions, um, but, but of course this complicates a bit the story. Uh, it can be done algorithmically. So, so at least that's a plus. And, and so in the end of, of, the, of the day, so transformations in this language you can do on trees can be made on, on, on uh, can be formalized as writing rules, but I mean, with the expense of this calculus, that, that is to be said. But in principle, uh, it is now completely formalized how to do these transformations. Okay, and now finally, so the, the idea is how do you now get to combinatorics? So how do you get to a calculus um, on, on these graphical writing steps? And the idea is that, um, so as in these pictures in the introduction, you want to reason about all possible ways of applying n different transformation steps, where each step is chosen from some finite vocabulary of possibilities, let's say, for example, vertex creation, vertex deletion. So you want to classify the ensemble of all possible trajectories, let's say, for a fixed input state x0. And, and the strategy, which is very efficient, is to first classify all possible ways how these n steps can interact with themselves. So sort of the minimal context you need to fire a given transition, to apply a given sequence. And then as a separate step, ask uh, how many ways are there then to apply the overall of such input to the state x0. And so this is precisely this idea of, of tracelets um, completely formalized in this categorical writing theory now. Okay. And so the idea is that if you, again, Look, so this is now the analog of uh, one of these diagrams from before in the graphical setting where you now have three steps there in the sort of shaded boxes. Um, they are drawn from right to left. And this wiring diagram indicates uh, sort of a, a possible sequence how, how these three steps could interact. And you can produce from it um, now this type of tracelet. So the, the idea is that uh, each of the wires codes for an overlap. And now, for example, you can take, you can zoom in on the first two and compute how they interact, uh, producing this little subsequence of events. And now, um, now you see that indeed um, the overlap of this third diagram with what you just produced is now a proper graph. So there's no half edges or stuff like that. So you can glue together and uh, you essentially just complete um, sort of the full sequence of events that is minimally coded in, in these three rules as the, the bottom sequence. And it looks like this is, uh, and, and finally to obtain what I call tracelets, um, I mean, it turns out the only information you need to retain is just the outer hull of this diagram. So it looks precisely like just a sequence of transformation steps, but the specialty is that it only contains enough information um, to permit the sequence to occur, not all, I mean, this could be happening in a much larger context. And, and so this is exactly where you gain something in the complexity. Um, and at first sight, it seems this is sort of asymmetric, but one can show that, that it's equally possible 
to build up this tracelet from the same diagrammatic overlap structure, uh, um, just in a sort of first computing what, what how three and two overlap and then also overlap this one. So that, that's uh, um, sort of part of this calculus. Okay, so I mean, it's just to say that these, these di diagrams can be completely coded as just sequences of applications. And on those now you can do a combinatorial calculus. So sort of the, what's combinatorially interesting is that now you are given your vocabulary. So it's just the, the abstraction of saying sort of the, the top parts are the, the colored bars are the individual rules. And so you can build up all possible trace, let's say here of length four by recursively composing um, or iteratively composing uh, your letters. And so in each of these steps, of course, you can perform analysis. So this is exactly this philosophy of the diagrams that you can, you can reason transitively, so to speak, on, on compositions. Okay, and so um, I, I just want to briefly show how this looks like in practice. So a trace set of length one is just, you know, the special case where you have just one rule, it really only needs its input. So that's sort of the, uh, sort of the trivial case. Um, and sort of what I showed just in pictures looks uh, in, in reality, like um, you, you're inductively building tracelets of length n plus one from tracelet of length n and tracelets of length one. And, and so uh, it is just to show you that, that even in the case of trees, um, this doesn't look pretty, I admit, but it can be encoded uh, in, in the algorithm. So, I mean, this is a fully formalized structure. Um, and uh, sort of one of the interesting features of these tracelets is that um, you, you have uh, at the bottom of this diagram, the sequence of steps. And so you can read out the composite effect of that sequence. And in, in the language of Duchamp and Penson, these Hopf diagrams, this was exactly this operation of evaluating the net effect, how this acts in the heisenberg weyl algebra. So this is now generalized here as reading out the net effect of the sequence of transformations. So, so that is nice, that's called the evaluation. And this evaluation um, is also compatible now with composition. So you can indeed, so the analog of diagrammatic composition is now composing these tracelets. And again, it is only important to take an overlap of the, the output of the tracelet with an input of the next. And so this is very exactly analogous to this diagrammatic composition. Um, and finally, uh, so maybe just to, 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 uh, to say, so there is now this operation of composing two tracelets drawn with this wedge notation at the bottom here. And this composition now, now of course, if we go with analogy should be associative uh, in some sense. Um, and uh, indeed, sorry. Uh, and indeed it is associative in the sense that just as in the uh, duchamp penson case, um, sort of the number of ways to wire two diagrams together and then with a the third um, are exactly isomorphic to the number of ways, um, first wiring the third and the second, and then of the result with the, with the first. So that is, that is a property this uh, structure has. Now, finally, to put everything together, um, there's now precisely uh, this aforementioned characterization that if you have a sequence of transformations you can equivalently count all possible ways of performing these transformations by first counting the number of ways you can compose up these tracelets and then <coughs> together with number of ways to applying them. So that's sort of, uh, it's just to say this now exists for, for, for all of these writing theories, including of course the uh, Hopf case. Okay, and, and sort of the final piece of the puzzle is then how to actually get from here to algebras because we want to analyze everything using commutator relations. W one thing one has to do from the start, I mean, we already had to go to isomorphism classes for rules to even obtain a set uh, of, of equivalence classes. And again, there's something like this also for tracelets. So sort of everything is constructed with pushouts and pushout complements and so forth. So you have to quotient by isomorphisms. Um, something less trivial is that, um, so you, you do, traces are slightly too large. I mean, normally you do not want to keep every bit of this information. In particular, you do not want to keep like in this diagram here, information of order when, when the steps are completely exchangeable up to the effect. And so that's called shift equivalence. And, and finally, uh, 
there's one oddity which is that simply formally the, the trivial rule sort of intuitively should should leave uh, a transformation sequence invariant but formally i mean it just produces an n plus one length sequence with some repeated parts so you can define an equivalence that simply quotients out by such occurrences and if you put all of these together indeed then um oops sorry this uh, Oh, sorry. Yeah, here uh, you 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 get to um, exactly now. Finally, the construction of a trace with algebra. Basis elements are are labeled by equivalence classes of these tracelets under under the aforementioned equivalences. And now the product is precisely as in the duchamp penson construction: the wiring together in all possible ways, the overlaps in all possible ways of the tracelets. So this is now the tracelet uh, algebra product, and um, you can give an action of tracelets on states precisely by um, this aforementioned tracelet characterization that if you have a sequence coded in a tracelet, you can apply the entire sequence by finding embeddings of the overall input into your state. And this gives you a representation of this algebra. So the theorem here is that um, not only does do these tracelets um, give rise to an associative unital algebra, but moreover, this row is indeed a representation, which means that you can, um, if you if you now want to do combinatorics on numbers, if you want to count number of ways of applying writing sequences, you are free to first, you can partition your problem uh, by this uh, bottom right outcome of the equation into first trying to characterize the number of overlaps of tracelets, um, which is very uh, advantageous because now you can use uh, relations such as commutators and so forth. So this is uh, sort of the, the final outcome. And um, I then realized while preparing the talk that this was already much too much information. So let me just conclude on, on um, reproducing the special case of discrete uh, diagrams. So here you see on the left, the, the elementary sequence of creating a vertex and deleting a vertex. This is how it looks like in a tracelet. So this is the analog of the diagram of, of this generator E in, 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 in the combinatorial Hopf algebra. And on the right, you see exactly why you need this uh, shift equivalence because, I mean, creating a vertex and deleting, I mean, forgetting, uh, taking equivalence class is the same as, you know, in quotation marks first deleting and then creating. Um, and this is in the tracelet language exactly uh, obtained through such an equivalence. So it's not, you know, a trace value, but we label the elements of the algebra by equivalence classes. And finally, then indeed, the type of relation you can then derive are precisely commutation relations. And, and those are key to the, to the analysis in these combinatorial arguments. OK, and I mean, I, I wanted to speak about planar rooted binary trees, but uh, I, think, I think I'm out of time. So um, it's just to say that in this calculation, and I, I also showed this last year um, at CUP, uh, one can now start to see combinatorial simply counting arguments on why certain commutators have the form they do. So that's that's sort of the main motivation for this work, but I, I do realize I'm I'm out of time. So it's just to say sort of one of the so this will be a forthcoming paper for beginning of next year, and one of sort of one of the cases will be an explanation of why sort of you know you see a certain commutator structure in these planar root binary tree computations. Okay, but uh, so let me conclude to stay in the time limit. Um, so. Uh, I've, I've given you a quick tour of a new concept, which I call tracelets, which is uh, intended as a generalization of this Duchamp, Penson, et al. construction of um, diagram algebras. Uh, it seems to be very useful. I mean, it's, it's, I, I have a sort of, I'm developing an implementation of this with a Z3 SMT solver, which is available online, but I mean, this is work in progress. Um, and sort of the mathematically interesting question is maybe whether you also have some Hopf algebra structure on these tracelets, which for some cases I know one can demonstrate, but in general is, is sort of a research question. And sort of the, the, the long-term goal of this work is to bring combinatorics also into these bio and organochemical reaction systems, which through the tracelets now will boil down to enumerative combinatorics on, on, on tracelets. Okay, and with this, I would like to thank you for your interest and uh, thanks a lot for, for your time. Thank you very much, dear uh, uh, Nicolas, for this is.
Uh, are there uh, questions? Uh, yes, I have one question. Uh, what about uh, directed graphs? Uh, do, do, does your construction apply applies to, to, to this? Yes, yes. Sorry, sorry, I just showed underrated for, for the sake of the diagrams. No, no, so it applies for any type of, uh, of graph you can formalize uh, categorically. Um, so even for a simple graph or for multigraph or for hypergraphs or for attributed graphs and so forth. No, I mean, it was just for the pictures. So directed graphs in particular are appreciative. Um, you know, you can formulate them as appreciative. Uh, and so any adhesive category, so any appreciative gives you an adhesive category. So that's, yeah. Okay. And in, in particular for the directed graph case in this paper, in this archive preprint, we even have the Hoff algebra structure. So may I ask a question? Yes. Yes. Other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Uh, Nicola, can, uh, could you describe the construction of a Penrose tiling with your graphs? Is it possible? Aha. Um, it's like simple chemistry after all, but yeah. it's two dimensions. So, I mean, the only question about this is whether you can um, generate your tiling in some process which only asks local information. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not quite familiar with Penrose tilings, but I mean, no, if it, you can it, describe- like that. You have just, you have just several tiles of forms and there are just uh, rules, quite simple rules, how to glue them together. Interesting, yeah. That's all. But yeah, so, so, so that sounds very much like an example you could study, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's all quasi-crystals because it is much more interesting than crystals because they are, of course, periodic, but this is aperiodic. Yes, so, 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 so one of the things I could imagine is you might, for example, ask uh, in such a quasi-crystal, what is the average occurrence, say, of particular yeah, exactly. sub-pattern? This is known, yeah, this is known. But probably with your technique, it may be described in a very simple way. Yeah, so in particular, if you have a model for, for how these local manipulations are fired, presumably. Oh, done. Of course, of course. It's... Yeah, yeah. Ah. No, actually, I have a little comment on this because also your stuff, it's like, it's really chemistry, it's bullion, it's no special structure. And uh, of course, in Penrose styling, you get things sitting on a plane. And in principle, one can, uh, for example, there are this universal questions equivalent to universal Turing machines. You, you do dominoes in two dimensions, like uh, square tiles, and each side is colored by some color and uh, yeah. then you try to build things since it's a universal tuned machine. Of course, you can start to glue things, you get some pieces of plane, so you get eventually yeah. some kind of um, space-like structure yeah. from abstract story. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's... I mean, uh, one, one of the things we tried was, for example, polygons. So you can have these sort of tissue models, which are simply just polygons glued, but I mean, without gap in the plane. And you yeah. have, can sort of divide the polygons, you can sort of insert triangles by expanding vertices and so on. Mm. And uh, this is also in, in the realm of these rewriting techniques. And well, sort of the- You can use it in, uh, there is a problem with capsid, uh, you know, the viruses ah. which have icosahedral symmetry. They are surrounded by capsids. These are just uh, coat proteins that come ah. together and they have five fold and six fold symmetry. And of course they build this Capsules. And again, there are very simple rules that make them glue together. Yeah, I mean, so, so the main motivation here is that um, for, for these types of theories, as if you sort of the motivation is if you have a good, if you have a problem which you think is of this nature, it is relatively quick to check how to formalize it into rewriting. So, I mean, it's essentially to see whether you need more information than what you can expand in a small local neighborhood of the rule or not. Yeah. And if not, there's a very good chance you can. So what you get in quotation marks for free are, for example, commutation relations. So you can, for example, ask uh, uh, the pattern, the counting of a pattern is implemented as just an identity transformation of that pattern. And so you can, for example, ask uh, how many of the occurrence do you have more or less before or after applying this transformation. And so th these commutators really carry a lot of information and yeah. it's much smaller information than if you were to analyze the entire structure. So that's sort of the main, you get sort of average information. Yeah. Other yeah. questions, remarks, or comments? Uh, can I ask one little question? Uh, have it yes. been studied uh, which information on, on this algebra are carried uh, 
uh, by some homologies of this algebra, like uh, Hochschild homologies or whatever, something like that wasn't clear. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, these these algebras have not been even written down. So, uh, I mean, so <laughs> <laughs> the question is, uh, yeah, I mean, the answer is no from my side. Uh, um, I, I I would not be surprised if you if you look at special examples, maybe you could. I mean, it, it would be more that you recognize the tracelet stuff in it rather than. I mean, I, I don't have a good answer. Sorry. I, I think it's it's a good question, especially in, uh, because uh, last year at Cup we we had this nice talk by. Um, uh, we had this nice talk about graph uh, homologies or cohomologies, I forgot, uh, mm -hmm. which also could be formalized through writing. So, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, if you have, but actually, if you have a good, uh, good, good uh, case, which you think it could be of this elementary graph like structure, I would be very interested because I would mm -hmm. like to play with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it should be possible in general, kind of point of view, saying that they should carry some information. Interesting. No, I would, I would be very interested if you could have a. Could send you a link, maybe. Mm -hmm. Reference. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, remarks, or comments? Oh, uh, ooh! Thank you, uh, uh, dear uh, Nicolas, for this uh, amazing and huge expansion <laughs> of our paper with uh, uh, Pavel Boisjac and Carol Penson. Yes. And uh, uh, I have a small question: uh, Are you? Variant uh, graded. Do you have each each time some some way to count uh, vertices or edges uh, so, so that? Yes, exactly. So so the reason these former Hopf algebra is that uh, I mean they are so uh, in, in my uh, formalism they are filtered. So it seems so. So in principle you could count the the occurrences of these connected components in some system. So I mean you, if you give grade two to the you know, this, this E pattern, which consists of two sub diagrams and grade one to each of the others, that would give you a grade. But the thing that generalizes is a filtration by essentially the, the cardinalities of the interfaces. And, and then this through this filtration, I mean, always when you compose, you, you exhibit a little bit less of the interfaces to the outside world. So that decreases the filtration degree. So, I mean, it's clear that this by composition gives a decreasing sequence. Um, I mean, at most you have the same filtration degree if you don't connect overlap, because it's simply the, the sum of the uh, overlaps uh, of, the, of the interfaces, and, and otherwise it decreases. And this happens to be compatible as a co-product. So, yeah. Ah, okay. Thank you very yeah. much. <laughs>